Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we hear during the last few days uh, bad news about what happens in Jerusalem. It started on Friday in the assassination of two of the Israeli uh, Mishmar Agvul members uh, who are from the Druze uh, uh, community. One of them is the son of a good friend of mine, Shakib Shanan. His uh, son, Kamil, was, uh, was murdered. And um, uh, this is, uh, as of then, uh, Israel decided to put uh, magnometers, I don't know how you call them in English, I think this is the same in English, you know, the, uh, metal detectors in the entrances of, uh, of the Temple Mount, because so far, only Jewish uh, people and others, means uh, tourists, had to go through inspection uh, while Muslims were exempt from this. Now, Muslims also have to go through these uh, 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 metal detectors, and they, of course, uh, uh, refused. And not only this, the Mufti of Jerusalem uh, issued a fatwa, means a psak halakha, uh, verdict, Islamic verdict, which says that any Muslim who will pass through these uh, 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 metal detectors, his prayer will not be acceptable in heaven. <laughs> means, apparently, he received a fax message or email <laughs> from heaven telling him that in heaven, Allah will not accept any prayer of somebody who, who passed through these uh, metal detectors. Uh, otherwise, how else could he, could he know that there is such a, 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 a situation in heaven which they actually refuse up there to receive and to accept any prayer of Muslim who went through this. Okay, so this is what happens in Jerusalem. And of course they protest, and the coming Friday will be a Friday of protest because of this, and they will, well, they will pray all over the city, except for the Temple Mount, means the al as they call it, in order to raise the attention of the Islamic world. However, in my view, uh, the, the Islamic world doesn't buy this thing and it will fade uh, and everything here is, uh, depends on the Israeli resolution about this and if they uh, face an iron uh, fence uh, from Israel, I think that they will retrieve and the uh, police does not give up and Shabak might give up but uh, after all the decisions in Israel are made by the Prime Minister and so far, I don't think that he will succumb to the demands. They have metal detectors in Everywhere. Mecca and Medina. In Mecca and Medina, they have detectors in the Vatican. So and surprisingly, they also have metal detectors in the Bituach Lumi branches when all those Arabs are coming to ask for allowances <laughs> and benefits for the children and the wives, the, the first wife and the second and the third and the fourth and their children. Uh, which the country pays for polygamy, which is forbidden in Israel. Uh, how this happens, don't ask me. Huh. And, and, uh, but, and then, in the entrances of the Bituach Lumi, definitely they have, and they do, uh, uh, pass through these metal detectors. So when it comes to money, it's okay. Huh. But, uh, so uh, this is, uh, I think you can call it hypocrisy. <laughs> However, uh, when we come to what happens uh, uh, these days, the question uh, which raises itself is, what the heck do they have in Jerusalem? Why Jerusalem uh, became such an issue within the Islamic world? After all, Islam was not accepted in Jerusalem. It didn't start its life in Jerusalem, neither in any part of Eretz Israel. It started in Saudi Arabia. And um, uh, look, they had all the opportunities to establish a Palestinian state as they demand today, if Israel is doing, sh we should do, on the West Bank, or so-called West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and to give East Jerusalem to the Palestinians as their capital. However, they had the opportunity to do it by themselves. 19 years, between 1948 and 1967, Jerusalem and, the, as they called the, the West Bank, was occupied by Jordan. 19 years, altogether some 7,000 days, if you calculate. So 19 years, more or less 7,000 days. They had 7,000 opportunities 
to establish a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Why didn't they do it when they could? What did they know then that they don't know today about the existence of a Palestinian nation and their right over Jerusalem? What do they know today that they didn't know then, that they didn't do it by, by themselves? Okay? However, even historically, Jerusalem was never any capital of any Arab or Islamic state uh, in, through the 14th centuries of Islam. So, historically, this demand is baseless. Politically also, they could do it, they didn't do it, so it's also politically baseless. So, uh, they keep telling us that Jerusalem is the third place in holiness for Islam after Mecca and Medina. And this is the common knowledge which everybody knows. However, when we try to check this, uh, this truth about the holiness of Jerusalem, we find out very easily uh, some, I would say, problems. The first problem is that, yes, Jerusalem is considered the third place in holiness after Mecca and Medina, but only for the uh, uh, Sunni Islam. The Shia, traditionally, do not consider Jerusalem to be any holier than any other place. The third place in holiness for the Shia is another town in the southern part of Iraq named Najaf. This is where Ali, the founder of the Shia, is buried, and many of the other sages of the Shia are buried around him, and that's what Sh and Najaf is the third place in holiness for the Shia Islam. Uh, Jerusalem traditionally was not considered any holier than any other city. Only since the revolution of Khomeini in Iran in 1979, all of a the sudden they uh, say, Helut Yerushalayim al Rosh Simchatam. They uh, put Jerusalem on, you know, on the priority of their Simchas. So uh, uh, it's rather, rather new. So all, all, uh, immediately, uh, the Shi Islam traditionally doesn't consider Jerusalem to be holy. However, not only in the Shi Islam, also within the Sunnah, there were philosophers, among which the most important are Razali, who died in 1111, uh, 1111 CE, and another guy named Ibn Taymiyyah, who lived after him in the 13th, 14th century, who both uh, were Sunnis, and they did not consider Jerusalem to be any holier than any other city, like Damascus, Beirut, or Cairo. So also within the Sunnah, there is not con no consensus about the holiness of Jerusalem. So this whole thing sounds fishy, or smells fishy. Uh, so let's uh, try to understand what uh, the whole story about Jerusalem is, to a degree that today, Palestinians say that they will not establish a Palestinian state without Jerusalem as its capital, and the whole Arab world and the Islamic world is behind them. What happened since then until today? And this is actually what we are trying to understand. The story, our story starts, by the way, this is our uh, try. Uh, our story starts uh, in uh, the, the Arab desert in Mecca, of the 7th century. <coughs> Muhammad bin Abdullah, a rather strange guy who sees all kinds of things during the night, starts to come to his fellow Meccans uh, with all kinds of revelations which later were uh, uh, combined into the Quran 25 years after he died. And the Quran is actually the, base, the basic uh, uh, book of, of Islam, parallel to our uh, Bible and the New Testament of the Christians. Uh, Jerusalem doesn't appear in the Quran. He didn't talk about Jerusalem even once in his lifetime, uh, it, especially not in revelations which he received, uh, allegedly, from Allah through the Gabriel, the angel. Um, and this Quran, uh, uh, doesn't mention Jerusalem at all. And if we want to check something in Islam and the Quran doesn't mention it, we have to go to the secondary source of Islam, which is the Hadith. 
Hadith is the oral tradition, and the oral tradition is actually stories which the friends of Muhammad told about him, about his life, anecdotes about his life, what he said, how he related to all kinds of things. Uh, uh, how he uh, 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 behaved, how he wore his shoes, how he buttoned his shirt, because all these things are very important because Muhammad was directed by Allah. He was infallible, and every Muslim in every time and in every situation should follow Muhammad in every aspect of his life. So this is why these stories, which are the hadith, the oral tradition, are very important. However, since the hadith was for almost 200 years, oral tradition, as it is, uh, many people felt comfortable to produce hadith, according to all kinds of considerations, especially political, co political considerations. For example, the, big, the biggest factory of hadith was the rift between the Sunnah and the Shia, which erupted right after Muhammad died. And every side of this struggle, the Sunnah and the Shia, authored Hadith about Muhammad, that somebody heard somebody who heard somebody who heard Muhammad saying, if, it, if you are Shi, you'll say that Ali, the founder of the Shia, is the best man on earth. Okay, this is the Shi Hadith. And many other uh, uh, examples which actually establish the demand of the Shia to government. However, the Sunni Hadith, somebody heard somebody who heard somebody, who heard the Prophet Muhammad saying that the Ali is a crook, <laughs> or a thief, or a murderer, or, okay, in order to undermine the Shi'i demand to the government, okay? So every side authored hadith in order to support its demand to power. Now, everybody understand that this is forgery, because it was easy to do, because it was oral tradition. If you're oral tradition, everybody can invent whatever, concoct whatever he wants. 200 years into the Islam, like 12 centuries ago, nine uh, 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 scholars stood up, gave a hack in the standard, and says, enough is enough. It is impossible that everybody authors hadith, as if, as if the Prophet Muhammad says all kinds of, of, of nonsense about the prices of uh, watermelons in the market, about what all kinds of other things which Muhammad had nothing to do with. Okay, because these things were concocted through the years in order to support all kinds of things. And they uh, actually tried to purify the hadith from all these concoctions which were introduced into the hadith. And they left out maybe five or six percent of the material. They kicked out more than 90 percent of the hadith which was there and in the year of 200 for Islam, means the 9th century CE, as a forged, concocted, uh, authored, questioned, all kinds of, uh, of uh, epithets they gave to all kinds in order to kick them out. So uh, this is actually what happened to the Hadith, and Muslims actually shouted that much of the Hadith is forged already thousand years and more ago. Okay, so this is, I, I must salute them because they were uh, uh, honest to say yes, part, large part of our tradition is forged. And everything about Jerusalem comes from the Hadith. So we have to take it with a grain of sugar or salt or whatever you like. Uh, so this is it. So when Muhammad started his prophecy to his uh, 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 people, to his um, fellow Meccans, uh, he brought them all kinds of stories about Allah, who is in heaven, invisible. You cannot see him, you cannot hear him, because he is an abstract God. And he created the world in seven days and created the woman from the rain of the men. And, and uh, he told them about Adam and Eve and paradise and how they were kicked out because uh, they ate the, for the forbidden fruit. And he told them about Noah and the ark and the wicked people who got flooded in the flood and about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Ishmael and, um, and Joseph and his um, multicolor uh, uh, coat and uh, how the brothers <laughs> threw him in the pit in the desert, how they sold him to Egypt and they fell with the lady and Pharaoh and the Israelites and the, the desert and about uh, uh, David and Solomon and Jesus and Johannes and all these stories. And uh, they uh, looked at him 
and they, they started to make fun out of him. What? This is what Allah told you? We know these stories already from the Jews and the Christians. These are all asatir al awalin means the fables or the stories, the mices of the first ones, means the Jews and Christians. You are recycling what they, what they told you. No, you are copy and paste. That's what you do. You know, those teachers know, among you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you, the, you copy and paste what Jews are saying from their books or from whatever they tell you, and uh, you tell us their story. Okay, they, they, make, make, they mocked him and made fun out of him. It was very humiliating, very hurting for him. And uh, he actually, his success in his hometown, in, uh, in Bill Place, in Mecca, was very limited within 12 years of activity between 610 CE. In 622, he succeeded to Islamize a handful of people, his wife and some others, nothing more than this. Uh, the question is how he knew all these uh, stories about uh, from, from the Bible, from the Mishnah, from the Talmudim, from the, uh, from the uh, Midrashim. The answer is very easy. He had a friend, a Jewish friend named Kaab, uh, who was actually a Yemenite guy who was apparently a rabbi in Yemen, and he ran away to Mecca, and he uh, find this, found a asylum in the home of Muhammad, and he was the source of all these Jewish stories, which are embedded in the Quran and in the Hadith. So uh, they actually, that's what the uh, Meccans uh, 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 accused him. He tried to convince them to behave in a better way, to stop uh, worshiping idols and idolaters, to stop uh, drinking wine, to stop uh, burying the daughters alive. He actually dedicated a whole chapter in the Quran in order to stop the practice uh, because they couldn't feed so many girls and girls are not fighters. So, and one woman, one woman can bring many kids. So why have so many daughters? So if a woman gave birth to a daughter, after a day or two, they would put her in a little pit in the desert and the birds and the uh, uh, animals were eating them. And this was the Wad al Banat, and actually he was shouting against this uh, dreadful uh, practice. And uh, of course, he, he was accusing them for, for uh, selling slaves, because slaves also were, were created by Allah. How come you are, you are created, and how, you are, how come you are selling another one who was created by Allah the same as you? And definitely, it was very humiliating for those slaves because they were put in the market, fully exposed uh, for the people to see the merchandise, uh, whether they want them or not. So uh, it was very humiliating, very hurting, and this was what they were doing. Uh, and of course, they were cheating in commerce and all these things. So he was uh, trying to uh, uh, maybe have them behave in a better way. So they hated him. They tried to kill him. And after some attempts to kill him, he decided that Mecca is too dangerous, and he actually emigrated to Medina, which is to the north from Mecca. And there he became immediately a, a, a judge because he doesn't know anybody, so he can be he can be an honest judge. And then he became the mayor of his quarter, then mayor of the whole city, the ruler of the city, the commander of the army, and he became a, a, a master of the place. Uh, and he, but he also tried to convert the Medina, the people of Medina, to Islam. In Medina, there was a big group of Jews named Bani Kuraiza. This was the name, the sons of Kuraiza. And he approached them. Actually, he sent Kaab, his Jewish uh, informant, his Jewish source, uh, to the Jews of Medina in order to convince them to convert to Islam. But they have the original religion. Why should they? Uh, uh, convert to the copy of Judaism. Mm -hmm. They also understood that all he has is stories or mices which he got from, uh, from uh, Kaab. So they did not convert. For a year and a half, he tried. And one of the attempts to convert them was by directing the prayer to the north, means to Jerusalem. Like telling them, hey guys, you pray to Jerusalem, I pray to Jerusalem, let's join 
and become together one, one community, convert to Islam, will pray together to Jerusalem. They didn't buy it. And uh, they refused. Uh, apparently, they mocked him as well. So he got very angry at them. Uh, so he burned their trees so they couldn't make business because they were living on, on uh, uh, dates. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't work, so he burned their homes. It didn't work, so he slaughtered them all. One day he slaughtered 800 uh, men and took the women. One of his wives, Safia, was Jewish, for one, a Jewish girl, uh, who was uh, uh, engaged to one of the uh, boys over there. And uh, uh, after uh, this uh, young man was slaughtered, she was a widow from, from uh, um, engagement. He married her and consummated the marriage immediately in his tent. She was then like 13 years old. Um, and and, and since there were no, no more any Jews left in Medina, uh, there was no point to, to, to pray towards Jerusalem because there is nobody to convert to Islam from those Jews. Uh, afterwards, he slaughtered two other groups, the Banu Nadir and Banu Kainuka, and this is the end of Jewish presence in the Arab Peninsula until this very day. Since there was no uh, presence of uh, Jews in uh, the Arab Peninsula, uh, he doesn't have to pay to Jerusalem. And then the ayah, means the verse, descends upon him to direct the prayer down south to Medina, to, to Mecca, he sanctified Mecca, later he occupied it, purified it from all the idols, and turned his back to Jerusalem until this very day. This was, during his lifetime, his only connection to Jerusalem. This prayer toward Jerusalem for a year and a half as an attempt to convert the Jews to Islam. Nothing more. He didn't get out from the Hejaz, from this area, throughout his life. However, in the first phase of his life, when he was still in Mecca, he had a group of followers in Taif, this town which is into the desert. This town is built on a big spring, which is there until this very day, and is very nice, a uh, very, very nice town in Saudi Arabia until today. He used to walk, to go there to Taif, to encourage his community to convert more people and maybe to collect some uh, support as well. The way to Taif from Mecca uh, takes two days, two days walk, two day walk. And between every two day, every two days, there is a night until this very day. <laughs> and at night, you don't want to stay out in the desert because you will be devoured either by four-legged animals who will make you a kebab and your camel a shishlik and you don't want it. Or two-legged animals will catch you to sell you as a slave and they will annex your camel to their fleet. And you don't want them as well. You have to stay overnight in a place uh, protected by the people who live in that place <laughs> as they protect themselves. And sure enough, according to Islamic sources, between Mecca and Taif, there was a village named Jirana, unknown today. And in this village, he used to spend the nights, the night on the way to Taif, and the night on the way back, because the way back also takes two days. And in the morning, and this is according to Islamic sources, in the morning he used to pray in one of two mosques which they built near the village. One was closer to the village, so they named it the Closer Mosque. In Arabic, the Al Masjid Al Adna. The other one was further from the, from the village, so they named it the Further Mosque. In Arabic, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the further mosque, the closer and the further. One morning, he wakes up in Mecca after a revelation descended upon him to the night. 
Revelation which appears in the Quran, chapter 17, verse 1, which says, Glory to him, means Allah, who took his servant at night, at night means in spite of all the dangers, those with four and those with two legs, who took his servant at night from the holy mosque, which is Mecca, to the further mosque, which is near Jerusalem, which we, means the deity, which we blessed its surroundings in order to show him our wonders <coughs> since he, means Allah, sees and hears everything. This is the verse in the Quran, chapter 17, verse 1. Glory to him who took his servant at night from the holy mosque to the further mosque in order to show him our what which we blessed its surroundings in order to show him our wonders since he sees and hears everything. His uh, followers uh, understood it literally. They know exactly where the further mosque is. A whole day walk and what a wonder. Allah took him during the night in spite of all the dangers all the day, all the way to Jirana, to the further mosque and back and the man wakes up in bed, safe and sound, and his wife swears that he didn't get out of bed through the whole night. <laughs> what a wonder. <laughs> okay, this is the night dream. They didn't make any fuss out of it. They were used to his visions, and they continued their routine. He died in 630 He's 32. Muhammad died in 632 CE. And uh, after him started the era of the caliphs. Caliphs means khalifa in Arabic. Khalif means like an able makhlif substitute. First was Abu Bakr, uh, his father-in-law, uh, who was the first man who believed that Muhammad is a prophet. And but Abu Bakr died two years later because a, a snake bit him, and this was his end. Second caliph was uh, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the commander of the army of the Muslims. He was young, he was uh, very, I would say, uh, a, a trained uh, combatant, and he became the second caliph. In his days, uh, 10 years which he uh, uh, was the caliph between 634 and 644, he occupied the, all the uh, area of the Sham, means well, today Syria, Lebanon, the land of Israel and Jordan. All this area he occupied within 10 years. Uh, and in the year of 638, uh, four years into his caliphate, he <coughs> occupied Jerusalem. He put a siege on Jerusalem, and the bishop Sophronius of the Byzantines, who was the last bishop in Jerusalem, uh, saw this uh, army of the Muslims, and he understood that uh, he doesn't want to mess with them because they slaughter every city which they conquer by force. So he decided to surrender. He opened the gate, went out, sat with Umar, decided on the surrender, signed with him an uh, uh, agreement of surrender, and, uh, and uh, actually gave the city without any battle, so they didn't kill anybody. And he brings uh, uh, um, Umar and his entourage into the city, and this story is told by Tabari, the greatest historian of, this, of the early Islam. And he takes them to a tour inside the city. They are about to enter the, the uh, uh, Temple Mount, and one in the entourage is taking off his shoes. This man was Kaab, the Jewish guy, who was the source of all the Jewish stories of Muhammad. This was six years after Muhammad died. And he was in the entourage of, of uh, Umar. He takes off his shoes because... Holiness. Holiness. Shal me'al Take off your shoes because the land which you are standing on or stepping on is a holy land, means uh, just like what, what did Moses in the desert. So he takes off his shoes. Umar sees him and asks him, what is this? So he says, this is a 
holy place. So Uma looks at him and says, you are trying to push Jewish ideas into Islam. You better put these, these shoes back on before I get angry at you. Now, Kaab knew that when this man gets angry at somebody, this man actually is losing the connection between his head and shoulders. And uh, he didn't want, because this connection is rather important. So uh, he put his shoes, anus alpi hadibur, means forced by the order of uh, Umar. Uh, this story, actually, which is told by Tabari, like a regular story, actually proves that in that year of 638, the caliph did not consider Jerusalem to be holy. Because if he heard it from Muhammad, that this place in holy, he wouldn't force a cab to put his shoes on. He himself would take off his shoes. No, he would tell everybody, take off your shoes, because Kaab reminded me, if he forgot. But no, he resists this idea that Jerusalem is, is holy, mainly because he didn't hear it from Muhammad. And he lived like this with Muhammad. So this actually is a proof that at that time, 638, Jerusalem was not considered yet as holy. Fast forward, fifth caliph, uh, who uh, uh, controlled the Islamic empire, not from Medina, but from Damascus, because of various reasons, we're we'll not getting into the reasons. Uh, he uh, 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 actually uh, turns, or because of his behavior and what he did, uh, and I'm talking about already in the 680s, uh, Damascus becomes, I would say, sin city. Uh, because of various reasons, first of all, because the people were very rich, got very because they looted every church, every abbey, every monastery, every uh, sanctuary of the Persians, everything which they uh, found in the way on the occupation of this area in Iraq and, and the Persia also, in those years already, uh, they looted everything and they, they uh, uh, dis uh, disseminated the money and the, the, the gold which they looted to the Hevre, to the, co to the combatants, and uh, their life became so rich, like nouveau rich, uh, in the Moscow of those, those years. They continued to drink uh, alcoholic beverages. It's very hard to, uh, uh, to get rid of it. And relations between men and women were, don't ask, uh, <laughs> stories of those days, uh, because all kinds of uh, tradition. Don't forget those days. The men were already were in the in the in, in the war. Half of the army is already in Iran of today, and another half is almost in Morocco, uh, in the western side. And um, every man, male, who remained in Damascus to run the country, there were at least ten women who do not know anything about their husbands in the battlefields if they are still alive or not, because they didn't have phones, or they didn't have WhatsApp, didn't have email, and didn't have trains or airplanes. So the detachment between the wives and the men actually created the situation that women, for many years, didn't know what happened to their husbands, if they are still alive or not. So they allowed themselves also to uh, uh, behave in a free way, as if they are not married anymore. So uh, actually, Damascus, into the 680s, become more or less, I think this doesn't work anymore, more or less uh, sin city. Is it working? Yeah. OK. Now, how, how, how do they behave in such? They know that drinking wine is forbidden, and adultery is, uh, is forbidden, and many other things are forbidden. How, what, how could they behave in such a way? They, they, they know that it's forbidden in Islam. However, there is a hadith which says that somebody heard from somebody who heard from somebody from the Prophet Muhammad who said that anyone who will come to Mecca for Hajj once a year and perform all the ceremonies of the Hajj in Mecca, all his sins will be cleansed and he will come out from the Hajj as clean as a baby who was just born. Great! We can have parties in Damascus all year long. Then once a year we'll go down to Mecca for the Hajj. We'll clear the account, settle the account with Allah, go back to Damascus to continue where we stopped, 
in an order to come in another year to settle the account. Okay, that's how they behaved in those days. In the year of 682, 50 years after Muhammad died, a guy named Abdullah ibn Zubair in Mecca stands up and gives a ha in the stander and says, enough. This is not Islam, what you do, guys, in, what, in, 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 in Damascus. You cannot defile the wives of the Mujahideen and come to Mecca you, to, for Hajj. You cannot drink wine and come stinking from wine and, al and alcohol, other alcoholic beverages, liquors, uh, to the Hajj. This is no Islam. First, stop sinning. Then come to Hajj to Mecca. And he blocked the ways to Mecca. Those people come to the caliph, and they met him in a day which he was sober, which was rather seldom. And uh, they to complain, I give out This man doesn't let us go to to Hajj. We, we need the Hajj to cleanse our sins, but he couldn't do anything because half of the army is already in Persia, and the other half of the army is in Morocco, in the west. And a few policemen, which he has in Damascus, are either drunk or very tired. So they, and they cannot uh, mess with those Bedouins in the south who, remem who remained uh, uh, combatants as they were all the years. So for 10 years, they could not go to Hajj to Mecca. So he collected his wise people, uh, you know, the ulama, the advisors, the religious advisors, uh, for consult, to, to consult with them. What can be done? So they tell him, look, very easily. Uh, of course, we cannot go to Mecca, but Jerusalem is under our hands. Jerusalem was holy for Jews. Jerusalem was holy for Christians. Many of them converted to Islam in order to get rid of taxes, which were imposed on Jews and Christians. And the idea that Jerusalem is a holy place is in the street because of those converts. Let's divert the Hajj to Jerusalem. He tells them, hey, but Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran. How can we convince the people to come to Hajj to Jerusalem? So he says, oh, well, wait. We'll take vacation from authoring hadith against the Shia, and we'll author hadith about Jerusalem. You know, remember this uh, verse in the Quran? Glory to Allah who took his servant at night from the furthermost, from, from the holy mosque to the furthermost to an accent. Let's tell the people that the further mosque is actually in Jerusalem, not in Jiran. Because nobody here, it's already 50 years after the Prophet died. Nobody knows about Jiran, nobody knows about what happens there. So we will convince people, we will author hadith in order to inflate Jerusalem on the expense of Mecca. And they, then those days, they took the story that Muhammad went to heaven and they connected it to Jerusalem. And the story in, in short is that somebody said that somebody said that somebody said that Muhammad said that Al Burak uh, uh, was born to me. Al Burak is a a, a, is a legendary a, a mule or horse, a female mule. A, according to some verse, uh, versions, she had wings. According to other versions, she had hoofs which arrived the horizon. I rode her, and she brought me immediately to the uh, to, 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 to Jerusalem. And then I met with Gabriel the angel. He gave me a test of prophecy. I passed the test. He took me into the haram, means into the Temple Mount. We prayed, and he took me to the first heaven. Then we met Adam, who blessed me and took me to the second heaven. Then we met with Jesus and, and Johannes from the second heaven. They are the custodians of the second heaven, who took, took us to the third heaven, where Seth, son of Adam, is the custodian who took us to the fourth heaven where Joseph is the custodian or the gardener and uh, the guardian and the, uh, he took us to the fifth heaven where Aaron is the custodian who took us to the sixth heaven where Moses 
is the custodian who took us to the seventh heaven when Abraham, the, the Khalil, means the friend of Allah, took us to the throne of Allah and Allah gave me the, 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 the mitzvah, the obligation of prayer and here comes the story on the cake. Uh, I prayed in front of everybody. Now, this is the story of the cake. Why? In Islam, the one who leads the prayer is not the one who has good voice or knows the nosach or has a yacht side or a year of mourning. The one who, the only one who is allowed to lead the prayer is the leader, the political leader. State and mosque together. They don't have churches. So uh, this is the combination between state and religion. Only the leader is allowed to lead the tefillah, the, the prayer. Uh, whoever tries to take the, or to lead the, the prayer without permission is considered as a rebel. Okay? So, Muhammad is leading the prayer, and behind him, Moses from the sixth floor, and, Johann, and, and, Je and Jesus from the second. Means that they actually accept his leadership because they pray behind him. Means this event in heaven actually is the embodiment of the idea that Judaism resembled by Moses and Christianity resembled by, by, by Jesus Christ actually delegate the message to Muhammad, the representative of Islam. They actually give up. Moses and Jesus are giving up on the role or the religious role which they had until that event. And everything is being given to Islam. And Islam now is the higher of both Judaism and Christianity. This story is the most important story of Islam because it establishes the idea that Islam is actually a real religion, din haq, as it's stated in the Quran, while Judaism and Christianity become din batil, means religion of falsehood. This is the meaning of this story. Islam is no more asatir al-awwalin, means the mises of the first ones. It is now the only religion in Nadin in Adali and in Ain Nadin in the Lahil Islam means religion at Allah is only Islam, another verse in the Quran, which also supports this idea that Islam is the only religion, while Judaism and Christianity are null and void. Everything which was ever Jewish or Christian becomes Islamic. Abraham becomes the first Muslim. Isaac. Jacob, Joseph, all were Muslims. Jesus Christ, another Muslim. King Solomon built a mosque in Jerusalem. According to this re-engineering of history, according to the Islamic view. Judaism lost a land, Christians as well. Everything becomes Islamic. And this story is connected to Jerusalem. Not to Mecca. So where will you go to Hajj? To Mecca or to Jerusalem? Definitely to Jerusalem. And they continue. The, the ulama of the fifth caliph, the sixth caliph this time, uh, 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 Yazid, uh, to author thousands of stories which are actually aimed at bringing Jerusalem to a status higher than Mecca, like the value of prayer in Jerusalem, which is higher than the prayer in Mecca. Sleeping in the streets of Jerusalem will actually cure you through all kinds of illnesses and uh, disabilities. And this is actually what in their stories uh, 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 were authored in order to convince people to come to Jerusalem for pilgrimage rather than going to Mecca uh, because Mecca is closed. All these stories were actually abandoned like 10 years later 
because Abdali and Zubay, the rebel, was caught, was killed, was decapitated and crucified by the caliph. And uh, all, the Hajj went back to Mecca and all these stories went to the storage until the days of Saladin, who fought the Crusaders in the end of the 12th century. Uh, he, all, he again sold all these stories to his uh, soldiers in order to inflame them against the uh, Crusaders, and it worked to a degree that like 100 years later, even Taimiyah, the scholar which, which we mentioned before, had to author a book which banned going to Jerusalem for pilgrimage, banned performing the Hajj ceremonies in Jerusalem, and said that Jerusalem is nothing holier than, no, no, not holier than any other city. And he is from the Sunnah. But in 1967, a disaster happened. The Jews occupied Jerusalem and started to act on the Temple Mount. And they want to pray there. And one rabbi, Shar Yashuv Kohen, wants to build a, a, a synagogue. This way, Jews are coming to Temple Mount. Judaism is coming back to life. After it was pushed to be null and void by Islam. Because those Jews are coming back to the land, establish a state already in 1948, while Jews have only the permission to live under the mercy of Islam as dhimmis with very little rights. Jews cannot ride on a, 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 on, on, on a horse, only a, only a donkey, to denigrate him. A Jew should pay the jizya, skull tax, when he's humiliated, calling on the, on, on the ground. All these Jews all of a sudden make, establish a state with the force, with the army, with the police, and they kill Muslims in 1948 already. Since when do they have the right to, to a state? The Jews, they didn't believe in Muhammad, therefore they should live under Islamic rule forever. So this is the first uh, road accident. The second was the occupation of Jerusalem. And now what will happen? Those Jews will want to rebuild the temple, and this way Judaism will resurrect, come back to life, what will happen with Islam, which came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity. Means the whole returning of Jews to Eretz Israel, the whole establishing of the state of Israel, even if on a square, square centimeter on the beach of Tel Aviv, and occupation of Jerusalem, as they call it, and the activity of Jews on the Temple Mount, actually for them, is a returning of Judaism to be a relevant religion. And this is a theologic threat on Islam before it is anything connected to territory or to national issues or legal issues or civil issues or judicial issues, or whatever other issues. It's, first of all, a religious problem which Muslims can not contain. They cannot fathom how the Jewish religion actually comes back to life in Jerusalem and particularly in the Temple Mount. This is actually the, the fight or the war of the Muslims for the validity of Islam. Because if Judaism comes back to life, all the jokers will come back and say that the Islam is no more than Asatir el awwali the mices of the Jews and Christians. And ladies and gentlemen, this allegation that Islam is no more than mices of the first ones appears in the Quran no less than 11 times. And they are obsessed with this allegation because they cannot face it, especially if Judaism comes back to life. As a result, the Palestinians who know that they will be blamed by the Islamic world if they leave Jerusalem to the Jews. They produce these calves, which they go around in demonstrations, saying, al Lana, Jerusalem is ours, since when it's theirs. But they, they, they declare, and this is by the PLO, not Hamas even, our friends. <laughs> <laughs> However, the other side is Palestine. The whole country. So where is Israel? Nowhere. And they know the connection. 
If they have Jerusalem, they have the whole country. Because Jews will lose hope if they are forced to give up on Jerusalem. This is why they hammer on the issue of Jerusalem day and night, using the fact that many countries, all the countries in the world, have not yet moved the embassies to Jerusalem, means that the world factually agrees that Jerusalem should not be in Israel. So they hammer on this. They don't talk about Tel Aviv. They don't talk about Be'er Sheva or Haifa because they know that the world will not agree with them. But Jerusalem, unfortunately, the world, to an extent, agrees with them. This is why the, the world does not move the embassy to Jerusalem. And this is why they do not give us peace. Because peace will be an uh, insurance policy for Israel to live forever. This way, we can get rid of Israel, but getting Jerusalem out of Israel, the Jews will, will lose hope and will return to Poland, to Morocco, to Iraq, to America, to wherever they came from. And this is why there is no peace. Because they still have hope to get rid of us altogether. If the world wants to contribute to peace, they should all move the embassies, all the embassies, not only the American, to Jerusalem. Because this will show our neighbors that their war is finished. They lost it. Because the whole world supports Israel to a degree that they move the embassies to Jerusalem. And this is when they will give us peace because they cannot get rid of us. And this is the only peace which exists in the Middle East. Because peace in the Middle East, salam, doesn't mean peace like in English. Salam means truce or ceasefire with a document. This is what salam means. Peace in English is a totally different word in Arabic, sulh, which nobody talks about. <laughs> nobody talks about. They are ready to give us salam, means documented ceasefire. And this is what they give us. And we have the, all, the, all the proof for this. We have Salam with Egypt and, and Jordan, which do not shoot at us according to the agreement. But they fight us in every possible arena, in the United Nations, in UNESCO. Jordan was behind the, was the, the state which forwarded this decision about Jerusalem a few months ago. That Jerusalem is, not, is holy only for, for Islam. Jordan, our friend because they gave us salam, not peace. Salam, which means in Arabic, truce or ceasefire. They don't shoot at us, but they act against us in every possible arena as enemies, because salam doesn't include the United Nations, that anything else, only we don't shoot at you. That's the whole thing. However, I would buy it, because this is the only salam, which only peace, only kind of peace, which there is in the Middle East. There is no other peace in the Middle East. And this is the culture, unfortunately, of this area. And peace, this truth, is given only to an invincible country or the invincible party. People leave him, leave him or this party alone because it's too dangerous, too dangerous to mess with. I would take it, but I would make sure that Israel is strong forever. So this, this is how we can get temporary peace forever. If we are strong enough, if we are dangerous enough, and if they are afraid enough to mess with us, if the world supports us. This is why I think that every country which will move its embassy to Jerusalem will contribute to peace, which will be given to us only because we are invincible. And of course, organizations like the ZOA and many others who support Israel definitely contribute to peace because peace in the Middle East is given only to the invincible. Jerusalem is Jewish, was Jewish, when their forefathers were drinking wine, burying their daughters alive, and worshipping idols and idolaters. That time, we were worshiping God in Jerusalem 3,000 and more years ago. Islam is young, only 14 centuries. We have nothing in Mecca. Let them be in Mecca. If they want Medina, it's also okay with us. 
They should leave Jerusalem to its owners, historical owners, and the world should accept it. Because their fight over Jerusalem is not actually about Jerusalem. Their fight over Jerusalem is actually in order to prove to themselves before others that Islam has some kind of validity, which they are not sure. And if we, Jews, surrender and succumb to their uh, 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 narrative about Judaism, which is not in void, I think that we lost the battle. I don't think that we should succumb to their mindset, to their inability to accept other religions as valid religions. And we should tell them nicely, politely, but decisively, hey guys, your place in Mecca and Medina. And we highly support all the Arabs' right of return to the Arab Peninsula. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.